Hello and welcome to Socialism. The weekly Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. A magnificent mass movement, overwhelmingly young, black and working class, but also very multiracial, has erupted in the United States, Britain and internationally against racism. Its trigger was the racist police murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis on the 25th of May 2020. But young people and workers are angry about years of systemic racism as well as all the class inequality, privations and oppression of the capitalist system. The Socialist Party and our sister parties around the world have been to the fore on these mass protests, discussing with young working class people about how to fight racism and capitalism. And we've been signing up big numbers, interested in finding out about joining the socialists. While we carry on this vital work, supporting the protests and offering ideas for the discussion about how to build a movement to win, we are rerunning an episode from the 22nd of October, 2018. Is the far right on the rise? At that point, the far right was mobilising far bigger numbers than it has since, but the questions of how to fight back and how to fight racism maintain their relevance. As far right groups attempt to organise now, supposedly in the defence of public monuments, how can the workers' movement overcome their violent threat? Where does the far right come from? And what is the record of the Socialist Party on fighting and defeating the far right? You can hear more about the Socialist Party's response to this fantastic new movement in our recent Facebook and YouTube broadcast on the 5th of June and in the recent Facebook and YouTube broadcast of the Committee for a Workers International on the 9th of June. But this episode, a rerun of socialism, looks at the racist far right. How to fight it. Okay, I'm here today with Paula Mitchell, who's the London Regional Secretary of the Socialist Party and a member of the Socialist Party's Executive Committee. Hi, Paula. Hello. Um, And we're going to be talking today about the far right, which I think is something that a lot of working class Mm. and young people have got concerns about at the moment. And I think it's really important for socialists to understand both from a strategic what's necessary perspective and also from kind of theoretically what is the far right and so on so we'd like to start with that kind of question really Paula Mm. so why do you think it's important Mm. for that for socialists to try and understand what the far right is and how we can fight it Mm. well I think you're right I think there are a lot of people especially young people but not only young people that look at what's happening around the world and they look at what's happening in Britain and they are fearful particularly because we've had 10 years of austerity And the Tories giving the impression that they can get away with whatever they want. We've had the Brexit vote. People look around the world and see wars. They see, you know, terrible crisis in the Middle East. The fear about nuclear war, even issues like we faced over the last few years with the refugee crisis. They see the election of Trump and the instability around the world that that's creating. And I think a lot of people are fearful about the potential rise or the actual rise of nationalism, of racism, the right. And correctly, people want to fight that. They want to stand against that. But that's why I think we think it's important to understand, to discuss and debate what these developments actually really do represent so that we can understand how to combat them. In our view, it isn't just a question of just getting up and saying that it's wrong. We have to talk about what methods, what programme, what slogans, the tactics that are required. And I think that's particularly important at the moment because of how you you can see that the world might be, you could interpret the world is developing in that sort of direction or people fear that it is, that there is this idea now that this is so big, this is is such a, a problem that we can't waste time debating, we just need to put all our differences aside. Um, but we think that's a, a, the, the wrong approach. It's precisely, in our view, when something might be big or has the potential of getting uh, to be a big issue that the discussion and the debate about what to do about it is so necessary. 
Yeah, and it's always been something that socialists have taken very seriously, isn't it, and tried to mm. analyse. And part of that is the risk that the far right can pose to the workers' movement, which I'm sure we'll come on yeah. to discuss later. And also the fact that the ideas of the far right can be so divisive to the working class and socialists are about, you know, trying to strive for a united struggle. And so the ideas that are kind of destructive to that, we have to be able to take them up. Yeah. So you mentioned there some of the big world developments that have made people fearful and Trump being a big factor in that. There's also Orban in Hungary as well. So do developments like that, do you think, do they show that the right is on the rise internationally? Well, I think, as I said just now, we've had 10 years, 8, 10 years of austerity. It's been 10 years now since the world economic crisis. After that, the ruling classes, the rich, big business, they set out to make the working class pay for that crisis. And they have largely succeeded in getting working class and poor people across the world to pay a really, really heavy price for that economic crisis. And then when you think that austerity came on top of decades of neoliberal policies before that, of cuts, of privatisation, of driving down living standards, of deregulation and so on, and workers have fought really heroically in many, many countries, particularly countries like Greece and Spain, where we've seen general strike after general strike. But in general, there have been huge battles. Workers have fought back to defend their jobs and their homes and their services. But largely they've been let down by their leaderships, by the trade union leaders, but also by the parties that in the past they would have looked to. They would have seen parties like Blairite's Labour Party or like PASOK in Greece. They'd have seen those parties as their parties that were meant to be in the interests of working class people and they've let them down and they've supported and implemented austerity as well. So there is this huge anger and it is seeking an outlet. It's seeking a voice. And I think we've seen electorally a rejection of those sorts of policies, a rejection of the capitalist establishment, politicians, people that are perceived as being the elite, the rich, that so-called centre ground, all these commentators who worry about the future of the liberal centre ground. Actually, that's the representation of these policies which people are now rejecting and we've seen that in there's been referendums on what on, on a whole host of different issues obviously most recently the referendum for abortion rights in Ireland we've seen the movements in Catalonia we've seen the Scottish independence referendum and, and the EU referendum in Britain was part of that where it was an opportunity to reject that capitalist establishment but we've also seen it in elections to parliaments as well over the last few years, again in Greece, in France, in Italy, in the US and, and of course in Britain as well, where again there's been that rejection of the so-called centre ground. And I think there's been, rather than it being a, a rise of the right, it's a bit of a polarisation mm. that when people have found something which appears to be anti-establishment that appears to be putting forward some kind of an alternative, then people have seized on it. So like with Trump... Basically, people voted for Trump because they couldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And we supported Bernie Sanders in that election, who was the most popular politician as a, a stated socialist and still is the most popular politician in the US. And quite clearly, if he had gone all the way, all the evidence indicates that he, he could have won or at least would have massively cut into Trump's vote. So I think it's not that the right is on the rise, but that there is this anger and this rejection and a seeking out of an alternative. People are expressing their anger in that way. And so what about here in Britain then? Because, I mean, you mentioned the EU <coughs> referendum and I think part of the fears that people have mm. is that since the vote for leave, since the Brexit vote, that there has been a shift rightwards here in Britain in terms of politics. What do you think of that? Mm. Well, yeah, I think you're right. The Brexit vote, obviously for a layer of people, they see that as part of a process of increased nationalism and, and racism. And it's certainly true that there has been an increase in reported racist attacks since that vote took place, which perhaps isn't that surprising given that the rhetoric of 
all the main parties during that debate. The Tories led Remain, and it was Tories that were and UKIP that were in the leadership of the Leave campaign as well. And on both sides, there was terrible anti-immigrant rhetoric whipped up. And when that happens, then it does encourage a small number of people who've got racist views to get a bit more confident to carry out attacks. It's a bit like when Boris Johnson made his remarks about the burqa just a couple of weeks ago, that there were more reported attacks on Muslim women in the immediate aftermath of that. But it's also true that, in general, in society, social attitudes have gone more to the left and that racist ideas, in general, actually have gone back. There's been some statistics in the Social Attitude Survey that show quite a dramatic change just in the last 20 years. Where now, I think it's just 21% of the population say that they'd be concerned, of white people say they'd be concerned if someone in their family married somebody who was black or Asian, whereas just 20 years ago it was almost completely the reverse of that. And I think when you look at things like the Windrush scandal, which broke earlier on this year, actually that shows the huge anger and outpouring of you know disgust, really, that there was amongst ordinary working-class people about that that even the politicians who themselves have been whipping up racist ideas themselves just, you know, a few months, couple of years previously were then turning around and saying, you see, it's not true that people are racist. Well, it was, you know, it isn't true that people are racist. They were the ones who was whipping up that sort of idea. And again, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's general election manifesto, that indicates that where there is that anger, it's an anger against austerity and against the rich, and when an alternative is put, when that is voiced, like it was with Corbyn's manifesto, then actually it's extremely popular and it can cut across those sorts of any tendency in in that sort of direction. The Brexit vote, in our view, was a cry of rage, and a a socialist anti-austerity alternative can provide an alternative and a voice for that rage. Yeah, I think that those on the left particularly who look at the current situation in Britain and what they see as the right having the kind of balance of power in the situation it's extremely pessimistic isn't it and I think that anyone who is actually you know active involved out talking to working class people on the street and in the trade unions and in Mm. the Jeremy Corbyn movement and stuff knows that that is not the case that Mm. like you say that there is certainly a polarization confusion and so on but that fundamentally working class people are angry and looking for any mm. uh, avenue to fight back, which is obviously a hugely positive thing. Yeah, well, you just have to look at the figures, don't you? There was 15,000 that marched with this so-called Democratic Football Lads Alliance in June this year, which is obviously big, mm. but there was 250,000 yeah. that marched against Trump and the same sort of numbers marched for the NHS as well you know so that's sort of puts it in a bit of perspective really yeah so well you mentioned the FLA there so coming on then to the side of it that is concerning and we should be organizing against what are the main features of the far right at the moment and the kind of the main ideas that they're putting forward well I think the main organization that is causing concern is this democratic football lads alliance which has been headed up by Tommy Robinson who used to be the leader of the English Defence League. There are other small organisations like Britain First and others as well, but the FLA is the main force because that is attempting to coalesce a sort of far-right mobilising force, a street force. And as I say, they did manage to get 15,000 people out on the streets in June. They got probably about half that in July when they tried to repeat the demonstration, which in itself is instructive because they link the second one to welcoming Trump to Britain. And as soon as they added in policies like that, then it was obviously the, you know, mobilised fewer people. But they've been having demonstrations in different towns around the country and in central London, ostensibly about free speech, mm. linking that to the idea of combating terrorism. It's full of anti Muslim rhetoric, as if all Muslims are terrorists picking up on child abuse and as if whenever there's any child abuse it's all to do with Muslims. Principally, I think they're sort of trying to target into this idea that no one speaks for us, you know, that we're the only ones who are standing up and speaking for ordinary white working class people and that they're being gagged and shut down. And that's the surface that they put forward. 
But in reality, they are trying to get this far-right force together. They've invited far-right leaders from different European countries to come and speak. They're reportedly being supported by Steve Bannon, who's from the new far-right, the alt-right in the US. You know, he was former advisor to Trump. He claims he's going to put up a million pounds to help to build a new far-right movement. So that's what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, um, I think just as a side note, and in, another interesting factor in it, isn't it, is that they try and dress themselves as kind of defenders of women and LGBT people mm. um, and that type of thing, which also relates to what we were just talking about, about how you yeah. can't claim it's just purely a shift to the right, because even the far right have to mm. take account of the shifting consciousness and so on some of these social issues, which is interesting. Yes, um, and Jews. Yes, yeah. yeah. But as you, you've you mentioned, they have had some big demonstrations which have been, you know, has been concerning. To what extent do you think that indicates that there is a base of support for the DFLA among working class people? Well, it's certainly true that they've had bigger demonstrations than any other far right organisation has for decades. I mean, the, the previous sort of bigger organisations before them. There was the English Defence League, which was mobilising people on the streets just a few years ago. Before that, you had the British National Party, which was standing in elections in the 90s in particular, but carried on standing in the elections until relatively recently. And they did win councillors, and they had a London Assembly member as well at one stage. But they didn't mobilise these sorts of numbers on the streets, and in fact neither did the National Front, even going back into the 70s. And they do have about 75,000 followers on social media, so it, it is significant. And obviously that does indicate that we've got to discuss this properly, They absolutely have to be countered. They are no doubt an absolute threat when they march. They encourage racists to carry out attacks when they marched in Leeds. There was an attack on a Sikh temple and on a mosque after they marched in July. Then, as you were saying, they're a threat to the workers' movement. That was demonstrated absolutely by the fact that they attacked trade unionists, RMT activists, Mm. after the march in London in July so it is extremely significant but we also have to recognise that as we were saying earlier on their marches have been dwarfed by the people who have been mobilised on demonstrations for the NHS or against Trump or against cuts and obviously also dwarfed by the number of people who've been so inspired by Corbyn's manifesto that they've joined the Labour Party never mind the millions that voted for that manifesto. I think we'd say that While undoubtedly the core of the DFLA involves fascists, hardened racists, violent racists, they're trying to exploit the fears and the genuine anger that working class people have got. And they've, you know, who've faced all these years of attacks on their living standards, who've been betrayed by all the main parties, by the Tories, but by Blairite, New Labour as well, in Parliament and in councils. But I think their actions betray them, and already the fact that they were seen to carry out that attack on RMT members already you know, makes it quite clear that actually, no matter what they might say, they are actually anti-working class force. So the Socialist Party, we don't just discuss these things on podcasts. Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've been active in the movement, taking part in the protests against the DFLA, for example. And also, like you said at the start, we've been trying to encourage discussion and debate on what mm. tactics will be effective in the fight against the far right. And in particular, we've drafted a trade union motion, which mm. um, has been circulated and, and passed in some forums. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yes, well, the reason why we've done that is because, obviously, as you say, the reason why we're talking about this, we do think this is serious and that we have to combat it. But we do think that the trade union movement in particular has the power to be able to defeat the far right and to prevent any development like this going any further. We do think that, and we we say this in the trade union resolution, that in particular... If the FLA or anything like them attempt to march in a local community, it's absolutely vital that there is a mobilisation to stop them in defence of that community. 
that mobilisation, particularly being a mobilisation of the community, is what's key, and of the local trade union movement. And the trade unions can mobilise on a local level, can mobilise hundreds, if not thousands, of people, of their own members and their, you know, and their members, friends and families. If trade unions took a serious approach of having workplace meetings and so on to mobilise and to make it absolutely clear that, you know, a body trying to march through an area like the FLA is not welcomed by that community. So they can mobilise, but they can do more than that because they can also provide the essential protection for demonstrations. I do think it's the case that when there's been small demonstrations countering quite large demonstrations of the FLA, they've been reliant on the police for protection. And obviously that puts people off. We can't be in a situation of mobilising people and relying on the police. The police in the past have been used to kettle students, have beaten demonstrators, have pushed back anti-racist demonstrators to allow far-right marches to take place. We can't rely on them to protect people on a counter-demonstration, but that's what trade unions have got the ability to do. And we think it's really important, really welcome the call made by Steve Headley and other RMT activists following the attack that took place on the demonstration in July in central London for a trade union stewarding group. And we would want that to be taken up really vigorously in the trade unions, because you can imagine that if each trade union discussed that with its members, encouraged its members to volunteer, you could come up with a list of hundreds of volunteers from each union. So you could have a list, you know, a really long list of volunteer trade union stewards that could be headed up by a chief steward with experience from the trade union movement. That could be a list that could be called on for any mobilisation. You could get hundreds of trade union stewards, disciplined stewards, and which would actually protect the demonstration and would also give people a lot more confidence to come. But also, and most crucially, trade union action to fight against austerity, to fight to protect jobs, to fight for decent pay and all of those sorts of issues for homes and so on, a mass working class fight, in other words, to end austerity can completely cut across support for the uh, far right. If they are attempting to grow, it's because people are in despair and the trade unions can provide a real concrete alternative to that, a real concrete fight of mass action against austerity and, you know, putting forward that political alternative, fighting for the jobs and homes and, we would say, for a socialist alternative to make that a reality. We are arguing for that. We've put that in our trade union resolution and we're very pleased to say that it's been picked up it's been passed in a number of trade union bodies and has now actually become policy of the TUC at their Congress mm. last week, which is very important. We have really welcome that. But of course, now we have to fight to make that a reality and also to ensure that the willing trade union leaders and trade unionists fight to make it a reality as well. So I think that's our next job. Yeah, it gets to the heart, really, of what we see as what should be the role of trade unions, isn't it? That there's a tendency for the trade unions to pass this type of motion that they get from different campaign groups and think that that's enough, that they give their support to this campaign, Mm. not just on the far right, but on the NHS, on anti-austerity campaigns, different things like that, and then to leave it to community campaigners to do Mm. the actual work, maybe donating some money or something like that. And I suppose what we try and do in our trade union motion on this issue, but also in general, is to point out that we want the trade unions to take a lead on it, to be at the Mm. heart of it. And that that is because the trade unions are the organised working class and it's the organised working class that we think has the power to bring about change in society. And that's kind of the importance of it. So what do you think has been the clearest example of why that type of approach, basing on the working class and a political alternative is the right one to take? Well, I suppose one clear recent example comes from Greece, where, as I'm sure our listeners will know, has faced the most vicious austerity for a number of years and as well has been in the centre of the refugee crisis as well, with a lot of refugees in Greece too. And We have always warned that in a time of austerity that that is the possibility that racism and anti-immigrant feelings can increase. And in Greece, a very violent far-right organisation, Golden Dawn, increased in popularity 
winning quite significant votes in elections, even despite the fact that it was openly a violent organisation that was attacking migrants and attacking campaigners, socialists and so on. But when Syriza, which was a, a new left party at that stage, put forward an anti-austerity alternative, then it shot to prominence and won, eventually won the general election, before the government, and support for Golden Dawn fell because people saw that there was an alternative which they hoped would solve their problems. Of course, now Syriza has capitulated, then that does open the door to the far right and to the traditional conservative mainstream you know, capitalist parties to regain. But I think that's a very clear example of how that political alternative, the far right, was rising because of that despair and desperation. And when a lead was given, an alternative was given, people mobilised and supported that alternative. Yeah, I think that's a really good example as well. And it goes back to the point you made earlier, really, isn't it, of why we think it is essential to have these discussions on what way forward mm. and why it's wrong to just have the idea that this is so urgent, all discussion is pushed aside mm, to just all come in together because it's not a point of us just being picky or something. It's that it is an essential thing that the far right poses absolutely. a real risk to working class people and to the left and to socialists and we have to organise in a way that can actually be successful in stopping any kind of significant rise of the far right in advance of that happening. And then in terms of Britain, then, there have been some important campaigns historically that we've been involved in, mm. played a leading role in, that have taken we've this taken type of approach, approach that we're yeah. talking about, haven't they? Yes, yeah. Well, we're in the 25th anniversary this year of the campaign in the early 90s against the BMP, the British National Party, which the Socialist Party, which was then known as Militant Labour, played a prominent role in supporting youth against racism in Europe, the YRE. Because in the early 90s, the BMP had a headquarters in South London. And in the area of their headquarters, there was a big increase when it opened of racist attacks, including, you know, most infamously, the murder of Stephen Lawrence. And at that time, they also had a regular paper sale in Brick Lane, which if anybody knows Brick Lane in Tower Hamlets, it's a predominantly Bangladeshi area. It was an enormous provocation to the local community that they were selling their racist material on that street corner. And they won a council seat, so the BNP won a councillor in Tower Hamlets. And that was clearly on the basis of trying to whip up racism of the white population in Tower Hamlets, that idea of people being left behind. And the YRE mobilised with young people and the local communities in both of those areas and with the local trade union movements in both of those areas. And we recognised that to be able to not just physically defeat the BMP, but to be able to mobilise local communities, local people, that this battle, it was a physical one of mobilisation on the streets, but it was also a political one to fight for the jobs and the homes that was necessary to undercut support for the racists and to unite the working class. And as you can read in The Socialist later on this year, to read the lessons about it, then there were real victories from that campaign. The BNP were driven from Brick Lane, Derek Beacon lost his council position, mm. and the BNP headquarters eventually was shut down. OK, so going back in history a bit then... <laughs> So Trotsky, we often talk about Trotsky's ideas when we're discussing fighting fascism in the far right, mm. and particularly the tactic of the united front that he put forward. Is that tactic still relevant today? Well, Trotsky's writings are always relevant <laughs> and important, and his uh, pamphlet on fascism, what it is and how to fight it, is a small pamphlet which I think everybody should read. Writing in the 1930s, when obviously fascism... We were in a very different historical period in relation to fascism at that stage. Trotsky was arguing for a campaign of all working class forces to defeat the rise of fascism. And his writings analysed what fascism was as well as in order to draw the lessons of how to fight it and defeat it, explaining that uh, fascism only triumphed after the working class had been defeated that it was the last resort of the capitalists who were prepared to maintain their profit system 
at all costs, if necessary, you know, crushing the working class and its organisations. There'd been mass revolutionary movements in that period that could have succeeded in sweeping capitalism aside. And Trotsky's view was that if the working class parties and organisations had come together to fight in the interests of the working class, to fight the bosses and the capitalist system, which was absolutely crisis-ridden, in terrible depression, you know, and had fought for a socialist alternative, then fascism wouldn't have succeeded. And while the 1930s were a very different period from today, that understanding that it's that working class based fight against the interests of the rich, of the bosses that can unite workers in a common struggle for the jobs and the homes and the pay and everything that we all need, that that is what can undercut support for the far right and defeat them, then we think that fundamental lesson is essential for today. And today then, how much of a risk is fascism? Well, this isn't the 1930s. Fascism isn't on the doorstep now. And in fact, I think that we would say that in the polarisation that we've been talking about, that's taking place under the blows of economic crisis as a result of austerity and neoliberalism, this is the stirrings. There is the a tremendous potential for the working class to organise and to struggle and to unite around demands that can fight in its own interests. And there is huge potential for a mass working class fight that can you know, just sweep aside these attempts to rebuild a far right movement, but can do more than that as well, can also sweep aside big business governments. There is enormous potential to build the parties of the working class that can fight for that programme, that can fight for a socialist society, which would mean that the vast wealth that there is in society is owned and controlled democratically in the interests of everybody instead of just the profits of a tiny few. And, of course, you know, fighting for that obviously you know, completely undercuts any attempts to rebuild a far-right movement at this stage. OK, so we started by talking about the fact that there are a lot of people who are concerned about this issue, but also getting angry and getting active around this issue. I think particularly young people, there are a lot of young people being kind of radicalised mm. in opposition to racism and the far-right at the moment. What is our message to them? Well, that's great. We're very glad. And we say, yes, absolutely, get active, go on the demonstrations, fight against the far right, but join with us in fighting for the tactics and the slogans that we think are necessary that can actually win and join with us in fighting for that socialist alternative. And I think, you know, we'd have to say that everything that we've said in this conversation is why in Britain we would say that fighting the far right is intrinsically linked to fighting to kick out the Tories, to drive the Blairites out mm. of the Labour Party for a, a mass movement that can not only force the Tories out but can also fight to get the policies we need from a Corbyn-led government to end austerity for the jobs and the homes the services to scrap tuition fees and for free education, etc., that we need from a Corbyn government. We need to build a movement. We fight for a mass trade union movement in the communities amongst young people for a movement that can fight for those policies that are necessary for a socialist alternative. And so we'd say to all these young people to join us to fight for that as well. And that's a good note to end on. So thanks very much, Paula. Thank you. As ever, if you like what you hear, Donate to help fund us and subscribe so you don't miss out. And if you agree, join the Socialists. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for a Workers' International. Today we heard from Paula Mitchell, Regional Secretary of the London Socialist Party, and I'm James Ivans. This rerun was edited by Nick Hart. You can find further reading in the notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. 
Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? We need you. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. What if you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country? Contact the Committee for a Workers' International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. Help us to take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.